Good day, everybody. Uh, good evening to Australia. Um, I would like to welcome everybody to our uh, free uh, web workshop today uh, on unlocking uh, performance post lockdown together with uh, our joint venture partner, Trinity uh, P3. And um, I would like to welcome Darren, who is styling in from a very late uh, in Australia. Eight o'clock is there. Yeah, uh, thanks, Dennis. Global CEO and uh, founder of Trinity uh, P3 and with me is as well Maria who will as well uh, help us in hosting this event and will um, uh, watch your questions and and bring you into the session uh, for for this for this workshop. Um, let me quickly add uh, before we start uh, some housekeeping this should be a very interactive uh, session so we want actually to take your questions we would like to discuss with you we would like to um, have an interactive uh, way to exchange ideas together so if you have a question there is at the bottom of the uh, event um, or uh, the webinar there's a Q&A um, section and there is a raise hand uh, button as well. So if you have a question, I can either raise your hand and we will then uh, bring you into the discussion and you can ask your question there right away, or you just can type it into the Q&A and we will then read it in and have it as well uh, part of this, of this section. So uh, Darren, I feel the world feels a little bit upside down so it's good to have an opinion from from down under and um yeah so how is the situation in australia yes yeah, so it's only when the world's turned upside down that suddenly australia comes to the top um we actually had some very good news today uh, dennis that the government uh, met and they've mapped out a three-stage program to uh, bring us back out of the lockdown that we've experienced over the last uh, two and a half months because the numbers are looking so good. Uh, the number of infections are in the single digits and uh, the number of deaths have dropped significantly, which has been a good thing. So we're looking uh, quite optimistically towards over the next, they're saying uh, six to 12 months, slowly unwinding all of the, uh, the lockdown provisions. Having said that, all of the indications are that Australia, along with most of the world, is going to roll into a recession, which has incredible uh, impacts for uh, marketers everywhere. Well, business and marketers everywhere. But uh, and what about in Europe? How's uh, how the state of things in Europe at the moment? Yeah, in Europe, uh, I think it is as well um, now improving slightly after having really been badly hit in uh, especially the southern European countries. Uh, it uh, was a was a very tough time, and then of course the European, the northern European countries and Germany and so on. They um, actually went very soon into the lockdown, and that showed as well some very good progress. And we are now as well in the stage in in uh, in uh, getting out of the lockdown, but very slowly, step by step, and very local. And um, I think one one thing in Europe that will definitely hit us significant in the next couple of uh, months is that uh, that international travel will be, will be still suffering and that is of course for uh, for an economic area like uh, like Europe a, a, a big problem here. Um, I think what we see now as well and uh, is is that you already see a little bit the changes or the impact of the of the COVID on the economy um, I saw yesterday some some newest results in in in, Ger in the German television and in the Swiss television, and uh, s some very interesting things. So they made uh, public uh, questionnaires, and for example, in, in in Switzerland they had the question: How many of the people will go back to use public transport as they did it before? And it was only a third that said, "Well, I go back as I used it before." That means public transfers will see a different, a different, definitely a different environment after COVID as as before. And another thing that we see now, very, very, very clear, clear in in, in Europe, and is something I, I picked up yesterday from the German television, which was um, uh, how many people see now see now that uh, that it will impact the German economy. 
and uh, about 76 percent so two-thirds uh, actually uh, three three-fourths actually said it will impact the economy um, but when you ask them about their personal situation about the same numbers so 74 percent said well i'm not so worried about my personal situation no. so but we see now that it will be quite an impact i think the important thing is now um, we will have winners or losers in this breakdown and I have there a slide. Can you quickly upload that one? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And I mean, uh, when we talk about COVID, then there was an impact, immediate impact on this crisis. And I think that was the big thing that caused a lot of uh, impact in marketing as well. Because suddenly we, were, we had clear demands from the government that says, well, stay home, stay away. Um, companies that said as well, stay focused, you know, uh, reduce uh, surgeries to the minimum in the hospitals, focus on uh, really taking care about the COVID patients. So that was stay focused, stay focused what you can deliver, stop production, produce, produce masks and, and these things. And the third thing was, of course, uncertainty. And the interesting thing when you look at it is all these uh, things had on one side winners and losers. Huh? So when we had to suddenly the thing, okay, stay home, then all remote services, um, all the online shops and all the ones that were delivering things at home, goods at home, services at home, and so on, were the ones that were actually uh, benefiting from it. While the physical services, the hairdressers, uh, the cleaners, the, the, uh, the doctors and so on, they had certainly uh, other, other issues they were having a decline. Same thing when you say about staying away, you know, so the community and the climate were definitely benefiting from it, while events and travel bis uh, business was, was decreasing uh, significantly and that impacted the high. Another thing as well, when you look at essentials, you had there um, the companies that were decentralized, that are flexible, that are diversified, came better through this focusing than, for example, the ones that had global supply chains that were centralized, that were specialized in things. I had just uh, last week a talk with one of our with, with a colleague who works in a an, in an food uh, producer. And yeah, basically said, well, you know, our gastro business totally down 80%. Huh? But what was interesting is that their tin canned, or the canned food business, which was, let's say, a leftover from the past for them, suddenly had a, had a, had a, um, a revival. Mm. And he said, well, you know, COVID is not so bad because that was anyway a business line that was suffering. And perhaps some people come back and will buy it after the crisis as well. Yeah? And then, of course, the big thing is the uncertainty. And we had all these panic buyings and this uh, thing. But actually, daily good product producers were very, very successful. I mean, there was this joke going around in social media about um, the, the German um, toilet producer was taking over Apple uh, so <laughs> because they made so much money out of it. Now, um, that's the thing. Daily, daily supply goods were very good. Uh? But on the other side, of course, it impacted definitely our mental situation. I think everybody, and I think nobody says he, he's, not, he's not suffering under it. I think everybody suffered under that situation. And now the big question is, of course, what will be the long-term impact? And um, that long-term impact that COVID will cause brings actually as well um, exciting time for marketeers because it changes our environments. Perhaps you can go to the next slide. Um, it changes our environments, and and that means we need to reshape and replan um, our our business and our marketing, our products, our services, how we deliver those services. And there are some very interesting trends to look at. And honestly, I mean, it's far too early to say which one will succeed. And I think as well, as well it depends a little bit how long will we be in in special situations. And, uh, and, not and, and not back into normal situations. But human behavior, how will it change? Are we going back in more hygge-ing? Huh? So my home is my castle, 
or are we going back to the global citizen that we've been before? Uh, social environment, will it cause a more, um, I take care about my neighbors? Or is it now I want to have my freedoms, me, me, me? Or um, as well in the political environment, that will be the most dangerous area. I mean, on one side, we see the countries that are led by women are the ones that are surviving that crisis best. Huh? But um, on the other side, we have as well the US, China, they're blaming each other already to be the, the source of this insight, or the European countries with the European Union, which is as well uh, an area of conflict. How will that come? That is all uncertain how things will, will progress there. But only one thing is very clear. We will have a, a problem with the budgets in the future. We will have a, a recession. We will have times where we, on one side, have debts and taxes that will increase because somebody needs to pay all this help that has happened now. And on the other side, we need to get back on track. So we need to increase our sales. We need to invest into marketing. We need to, we need to bring the, the revenue figures. And I think that's exactly a kind of area um, where uh, we now need to talk uh, how can we achieve more with less budget and uh, to achieve all these things. And um, yeah, Darren, um, you've been over 20 years uh, in, in, in the business. You founded Trinity uh, P3 20 years ago. I mean, there have been already a couple of uh, crises in that period, the dot-com uh, financial crisis, uh, SARS uh, was as well already once hitting us. And so from all these different crises, um, what is different in the COVID-19 for you? So the big difference for me is the fact that uh, the, the, credit, uh, the credit squeeze or the, the global financial crisis, the global recession, hit almost every business equally. I mean, once the, uh, the subprime mortgage collapse and the, the you know, cash became king, and no one, very few people had cash. So all businesses were affected equally. What we're seeing here is that not every business and not every category has been impacted. Clearly, you know, tra um, categories like travel, hospitality, these have been heavily affected, but then we're seeing other categories. And, you know, you mentioned toilet paper, um, you know, commodity items, food items, uh, uh, personal protection equipment for the, uh, the health industry. These are all boom. Uh, categories at the moment. The one thing, though, that we, as you say, is that there is going to be a shortage of money. I mean, almost every central bank is printing money to basically fund what needs to be done to stop this becoming a, a, a even greater human travesty. So eventually, we're all going to have to pay for that, all that extra money flowing in to pay for this, we will pay for. And we'll pay for that through there being a shortage of cash and we'll be in, in recession. The difference was that back in 2008, 2009, I had a lot of marketers approach us and go, my budget's been cut by 30 or 40%. What can I do about it? You know, how can I get my marketing plan done? And back then, we'd say to them, well, we can work through and work out where cuts can be made. But they would often turn to their agencies and say, my budget's been cut by 30%. The agency would go, it's okay. We'll do the same work for 30% less. Now, coming out of the, and, and it was a long climb. Remember that recovery out of 2007, 2008, it didn't suddenly get better. It was this long climb. The thing was that suddenly, what that actually done by doing that, well, from an agency's perspective, they were thinking, I'm helping my client. The message they were actually sending was, I can do the same work for 30% less. And that's viable and sustainable. So that there was no correction back. And so what we've seen over the last 10, 12 years is especially in the holding companies, because they're publicly listed, We've seen their performance drop. I mean, there's a small blip there with programmatic uh, media buying became a bit of a cash cow for a while. But, you know, the, the, uh, that was uh, quickly illuminated with the uh, ANA revealing 
the money that was to be made through uh, kickbacks and commissions and the like, secret commissions. So we've seen almost all of the major holding companies that are publicly listed see their share prices be diminishing, especially in the last three years. Now, why is that? Because the agencies have had this downward price pressure on them for quite a while. And in fact, we've got a terrific um, graph here that shows, I'll just share it with you. Um, this one here, we, uh, well, actually my colleague, Michael Farmer in the US, he's been tracking what he calls SMU, scope metric units, which is a unit of agency productivity. So it's for a certain amount of work, how many resources are required. And he's been tracking the price per SMU. Now you can see here, he started in the 1990s, mid 1990s, and it was up at around $450,000 US per SMU. Now, over time, that's dropped down to around 132,000. So that gives you the curve of how agency fees have dropped over that time. That's for creative and digital agencies. MSMUs are media scope metric units. And what that shows is, and we've only been monitoring those since around 2007, when the cost per MSMU, so think of it as a resource unit, um, the cost of an SM, SM, MSMU was around 215,000. That's dropped all the way down to around 96,000 US. So what we've, this is a prime example of the way the cost of agencies has actually decreased over time under that downward pressure. And it really did start at around uh, 2007, 2008 with the global financial crisis. So the, the question is, this time a market is going to be able to go to their agency and go, I've got 30% less budget, or I've got 40% less budget, could you do the same amount of work? The agencies do not have anywhere near the, the leeway in their business margins to be able to accommodate that. They may do it, but they're going to have to make up for it some other way, or they're going to have to just continue losing money. Yeah, so the lemon is squeezed, basically. Oh. Yeah, and, and you know, we would literally be getting blood from a stone if you think that the way to get more for less out of your agencies is just cutting your spend with them. Because what you'll end up doing is there'll be some sort of compromise for it. Yeah, exactly. Well, you, went, you once mentioned to me um, that uh, it is uh, that we can actually cut the output, uh, the, the marketing output. Um, we can still generate the same marketing output with 30% less budget without actually discussing the agency fees. Can you explore yeah. on that a little bit more? Well, look, I'll, I'll just one more slide before we get there, and that is creative productivity. Sorry, Dennis, but you know, this is the, if you take an SMU and look at the number of creatives or creative outputs, those numbers have increased dramatically because in the same period, 2007 to 2020, the average brand has gone from producing 125 to 200 outputs per brand per year to now three to 5,000 outputs. And all that, that's almost exclusively driven by the digital channels, such as social media and digital advertising. You know, the old days, you made a TV ad, you ran it for 12 months. You made a press ad, you'd run it for six to 12 months. You know, there was a traditional and relatively limited number of channels. Now with digital, we've got an infinite array of channels and it consumes creative. It's got a ferocious appetite. So not only have we driven prices down, but we've also, increase the number of outputs that the agencies are producing. Now, how do we get that 30% to your point about uh, to, to, to getting more for less? Well, the problem is that if you're producing 3,000 pieces of, of work through your agency, and it's all the same, there's nothing that differentiates one from another. 
You know, every piece of work is considered equally important. And yet we know that it's not equally important. So the secret to getting greater productivity and saving money from your agencies is to start using a priority matrix. And you know, I think most, most people in business understand you know, how a priority matrix works. It's about taking the work that you're doing and starting to prioritize what's the most important, what's the least important, and even what shouldn't we be doing because it doesn't actually fit. It's amazing when we look at so many scopes of work, how much work is, falls into this sort of producing collateral or commodities that are seen to be needed, but don't actually uh, get linked to a function of either driving brand value or financial value. So here's an example of one, you know, and it's a very simple example, but we used it for a consumer packaged goods company. And what we said to them is, you've got this house of brands, you've got all of these different uh, products sitting in this, are all those brands equally important to you? And of course, they're not. There are certain brands that have high strategic importance or have high financial return or both. And then there are others that have low strategic importance and low financial return. And then there's the ones in between. So the first stage was to actually start working with the marketers to get them to think about the brands, not as if they're all equally important. Because you know, I don't think there's a single brand manager alive who doesn't think that their brand that they're responsible for isn't the most important brand in the portfolio, if not the world. But what you need to do is start to think about those brands. So I'll give you an example. We, we worked with a, uh, a food company and they had a product, a brand, that had large market volume and made terrific, terrific margins. But they also had an older brand that was now waning and it was starting to decrease. And really all they were doing strategically was that they were now managing that decline but the actual returns on investment were actually very small because the reason they were managing the decline was the cost of exiting making that product would have been quite significant. So it, would have, it was more about reducing loss than it was getting a return on investment, okay? So we started talking to them about your growth brands you put in usually in tier one, your declining brands will often end up in tier three. Why is, why is this important? Well, because then you can start having a conversation with the agency to say, we want to not pay you on the amount of hours it takes you to do the work, but on the value that that work represents to our business. Okay? And so you can start to have a conversation around measuring or paying for the value of the work, not the number of hours. Because, you know, an agency will tell you it takes the same number of hours to do a outdoor ad, whether it's for a tier one brand, a tier two or a tier three. So, but why would you pay the same amount? Just because their cost base is the same doesn't mean the value that that represents to you is the same. Likewise, and it's not just brands, you can also use this approach for thinking about the work. You know, if there's a piece for one brand, if there's a piece of work that's about long-term brand building, you would probably think that that's tier one. Whereas if there's a, a body of work that's about acquisition, that would be tier three. And then your collateral work could be tier, uh, sorry, tier two for uh, um, acquisition and tier three for your collateral. And some marketers do this without building this framework because they'll have a tier one agency, they'll have a tier two agency, and increasingly they'll have an in-house agency doing tier three and tier two work. So, you know, they're doing it without actually putting a framework in place. But we think the secret to getting greater productivity and therefore more bang for your dollar or your euro is actually putting in place a framework, this prioritization framework, and using that at a brand level, at a campaign level, and also uh, even at a channel level. 
And I think this, this is definitely an immediate work that a lot of marketeers now need to do because, uh, because exactly that framework could now have as well changed due to Corona crisis. I mean, when you remember the, the example about the tin canned food business, which probably was a, a year ago, one of the tier three corners, mm -hmm. maybe now definitely a revenue saver for you as a, as a business, you know? Absolutely. Because the away. Huh? When, when we put this in place, we actually recommend that every six to 12 months, they completely review the portfolio to, just, you know, to see if any of these brands have moved. And in one case, we had a, uh, a product, it was a new product launch. Now, uh, the return on investment in the first year was not expected to be high, but it was strategically important. After the first year, when they went back to visit it, the product hadn't done as well as they thought. So they were able to drop it from tier one to tier two because they were going to invest less money in that product. Whereas under a traditional model, they would still be just pouring money into the agency. Now, you're probably sitting there saying to yourself, well, where, where do the savings come from? You know, all you're talking about is prioritizing and, and having a tiered approach. And that, that comes about here. This looks quite busy, but this is an example of what we call an output-based rate card. And I'll go to the next slide to give you the details on it. What we have here is it has actually four levels of work, origination, extension, and adaptation. The, the third one is simple adaptation. And what we're saying here is if the agency is creating something from scratch, it's origination, if they're refreshing or extending an existing campaign, that's a different piece of work. And then if they're just adapting an existing campaign, it's different again. And look, these numbers are just indicative, but you, know, you look at broadcast TV, you can see that the prices to the agency decrease depending on whether it's origination, extension, or adaptation. Likewise, within each of those, and this was, uh, instead of calling it tier one, tier two, and tier three, this client came up with the name hero work, meaning brand hero, push, meaning uh, to push a product or push a service into the marketplace, and then acquire, which was all the performance marketing, has very different tierings of pricing. So that they were turning the process around from having a retainer where the conversation is the number of hours, the salaries, the, um, uh, the overhead and the profit margin and how many FTEs do we need and, and that type of thing, to talking about what is it that we want the agency to produce. Now, in every single case of actually applying the prioritisation matrix and then linking that to a tiered output rate card, we have seen a saving of around 20 to 30 to 40%. And it's not because we're reducing hourly rates, we're just setting a price for the agency to actually work with in delivering the outcomes or the outputs to the quality expected. To show you how that works, I'll just go to the next slide. If you had a hundred pieces of work that you were paying a million euros for, at the moment you're probably paying it all as if it's tier one. But using this framework, you might find that, and this is fairly typical for a consumer packaged good, your tier one brand work is around 30% of what you're doing. Your tier two's around 40% and your tier three is around 30% of the total outputs. It's still 100 outputs, but all you've done is built a framework, and that would come in at around 800,000 euros. Whereas the next column is more like a uh, telco, uh, you know, a services company that's direct to consumer, and you'd have, you know, it's often around 10% is actually brand, because they spend a lot more, around 30% on acquisition or push, and then 60% uh, on more of the commodity, it's still 100, but it's now only costing you 700,000. There's your 30%. That's even without considering the fact that the applying the, that filter, that matrix, is going to eliminate a lot of work that gets done by marketing 
that often doesn't either have a financial return or a strategic importance because it just becomes part of the marketing plan that has to be done. If there's budget there, the work gets done. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and uh, so outpost based uh, uh, agency paying or remuneration. Uh, I, think, I think we have a question on that. Yeah. Yes. Um... So um, I, will I, will I will rephrase it. Um, it sounds like a win-win situation for the agency and the client. Um, it also holds a couple of prisoner dilemma traps. Let's, I'll call it like this. Um, so when it is um, incorrectly done, there um, is a prisoner dilemma trap. How can we ensure that it is a fair and also a transparent model. Okay. Um, look, there are, it, it certainly has, uh, there is resistance to the model. Okay. Uh, the first one I strike, I'll, I'll, first of all, I'll deal with brand resistance. The first one is sitting there and talking to a brand manager and telling them that their uh, brand is tier three. Because, as I said before, almost every brand manager likes to think that their brand is the most important brand. So this is really just bringing a business reality to the brand manager. It, it's usually done through giving them a smaller budget, but it actually allows you to start to look at your portfolio of brands or your services and start to tier those. The other thing it requires is it does require an increased level of discipline because it becomes a user pay system. Under a lot of retainers, the brand managers will continue to ask for work from the agency and the agency will invariably continue to do it under a retainer because they want to help their client and then just literally burn up resources, including money, doing whatever's asked of them. No one in that process is actually sitting there going, is this something we should be doing? Is this the best use of our money? So that's, that's on the brand side, the, the typical resistance that you'll get. On the agency side, agencies love retainers because a retainer says to us, here's the number of FTEs, you're going to pay their salary and overhead and a profit margin, hopefully, and then I don't have to worry about it because Financially, everything's covered. Now, here's, here's the downside of that, is that almost never do agencies actually get that level right. There is almost always more work than they've allowed for with the resources. So people get uh, uh, over-utilised, overworked. You know, in Asia, we've had people in the last three years die on the job from overwork. Actually, literally work to death inside agencies because they're not working 1,600 hours or 1,800 hours, they're working 2,500 hours. And why would they do that? Because from the agency's point of view, the more the person's working, the more money they're going to be making for the agency. So that's, you know, in fact, uh, if, you, if you want a bit of uh, light reading, it's not light reading, uh, Michael's book, Madison Avenue Manslaughter, it's a terrible word, but it is literally manslaughter. The downward pressure over the last 15 years has actually turned advertising into a bloodbath. And it's because we have seen lower and lower prices, but in return, they're juniorizing staff, they're uh, not looking for ways of being more efficient. In fact, Sadly, I had a uh, digital agency. We, we put one of these output-based models and the digital agency said to me, uh, we can't afford to produce those digital ads, those display ads, at the price on that, that uh, output-based rate card. And I said, well, lots of other agencies are. Why not? And he said, well, we do it all manually. We, you know, each ad is actually done by a person in the studio. And I said, including the resizing to the seven or eight different, yes, yes, it's all done manually. I said, why do you do that? Because you know there's software that will automate that. Yes, but if we did that, we, we charge by the hour. 
And if we put it into software, we can't charge by the hour because it does it virtually instantly. See how a remuneration model actually worked against innovation. The agency could produce those ads much cheaper and faster and with less mistakes, but they couldn't charge for it under a model that is based on the number of hours people are working. Okay. I would like to take the chance to invite our, our guests um, to, to uh, as well um, ask questions and um, to participate in the discussions. We discussed now um, how actually a change in the in the numeration model, um, how you to pay agencies, could actually help. Um, because uh, yeah, output out. I see the big advantage of output uh, based performance models is that we have uh, uh, that agencies have as well a motivation to to uh, make themselves more efficient. So as you as it, the example that you just mentioned, with um, they not introducing uh, technical uh, or digitalization uh, help uh, or, or new software to make it more efficient. Um, yeah, I think that's a good example that uh, output-based uh, models um, have definitely their advantage. Okay. Well, because, because moving the model to paying for the outputs, the, the marketer, the advertiser gets the advantage of technology innovation and the agency gets a way to charge for something that no longer has very many hours on it. I mean, there is so much um, automation that's occurring in the ad tech, martech area, and yet so few agencies are actually embracing it. It's interesting that it's the uh, consulting firms, you know, the Accenture and, and, and Deloitte Digital are actually using automation, but most of the advertising agencies really struggle with it. I mean, their solution is to build huge farms in, in uh, you know, digital farms in India and uh, uh, Eastern Europe and, and China, where low cost labor can still manually churn this stuff out. And yet there's so much technology that will automate it. You know, the, the thinking, the coming up with the idea in the first place, the, so, and especially for the tier one type work is where the value really exists. The implementation to roll it out through a whole lot of collateral should be low cost. And that's the thing. When most people talk about an output based model, they think of one price for each output. What we're talking about is, you know, nine to 12 different prices because it depends whether it's originated, an extension, a complex adaptation or a simple adaptation, and whether it's for a tier one, tier two or tier three activity. And so, you know, we're truly getting to value being the value that that work represents to the brand, not the cost of producing it that the agency incurs. Okay, good. I think we have another question from the audience. Exactly. So we try to get um, Katrin in. You probably can answer it live or uh, question ask it live. We will we will try if it works. Katrin, can you? Hey, um, I don't know if you can hear me. Yes, we can. Can you hear me? Hi, thank you so much. Um, it was just a simple question of saying that, so from my perspective where I work, I sit on the other side of the wall, so we are contracting agencies for a specific body of work. Um, and so far we've started thinking about incorporating, what we have done also in the past, uh, some incentive models. And my question was more if we start using a priority matrix and we actually define our priorities um, well, so with a, with a good level of accuracy, then is still an incentive in the model something that is be, should be considered or does it actually take out the value of having an incentive model for performance within the contract? Okay, um, and look, it's a, that's a terrific question because uh, what we've done in, uh, in implementing this and especially where there's been an incentive model in the first place, okay? So that, uh, even under the retainer, a lot of people have made it uh, very easy to take a percentage of the retainer and turn that into the bonus that gets paid. 
what we've actually done is said, depending on the agency and their strategic importance, the bonus should come from the investment with that t either tier one or tier two work. So we actually also prioritize our suppliers. We have a tier one suppliers, tier two and tier three. We incentivize tier one on performance of the brand. So if the brand is doing well, you know, brand tracking or, you know, in some cases where it's direct response sales or whatever, we use that for tier one. For tier two, we do it around things like um, uh, efficiency innovation. So if they can show ways of becoming even more efficient, then we would have a bonus scheme to reward them for becoming more efficient. And then tier three, uh, which are more your commodity supplies, we don't have. So the bonus scheme, to answer your question directly, doesn't exist within the matrix, it sits on top of that. But the matrix actually gives you a very clear focus of what you've been paying for. Are you paying for uh, strategic uh, insights and working, tier one, or are you paying for more commodity type work? This. Okay, Crystal, thank you very much. That answers a lot of my questions. Uh, my pleasure. And look, I think it's a fascinating area because uh, one of the things that happened back in 2008, nine was uh, so many people had uh, performance bonuses based on uh, survey results. You know, uh, you know uh, what are some of the systems appraised, decide where, um, you know, uh, TRR. And, and can you imagine going to your uh, CFO and saying, look, I know we've actually lost money this year, but our performance uh, uh, model means that we have to pay our agencies a bonus because they got an increased score on our survey for you know, how well the relationship's going. So we actually then turned around and, and from that date, we said you should never bonus anyone based on a survey of how well you get along with each other. Exactly. Although this is as well important for, for increasing the performance of an agency to work on the collaboration, but you should not go into the compensation model. I totally exactly. agree. I, look, I absolutely think surveys are great for improving the relationship and, and addressing problems, but it should never be incentivized. I mean, it's sort of like paying your friends to hang out with you. Okay, um, now Kwan Singh, um, yeah, we have another, we have another question, don't we? I yes, see. I will change. Thank you, Catherine. Um, I will change to Jeremy Taylor. Jeremy. Hello. Hello. Yeah. What's your question? So, quick question, Darren. Is this approach something that should be a, regarded as a threat for the agency, or is this an opportunity for agencies to do things better, do you think? Well, um, a lot of agencies, their initial reaction is that it's a threat. But I, uh, only about uh, 18 months ago, I was talking to the CEO of a major agency in the US, and he could see this as a benefit. And here's why. Most of his clients, you know, he, tier one, top agency in New York, uh, servicing multi-million dollar clients in the US, but he was losing more and more work to smaller, lower cost agencies. And, and when he talked to the marketers, they said, well, the problem is you're too expensive. You know, they didn't say tier two and tier three work, but they said, we're basically taking off you all this tier two and tier three work. And some of it's going in house and some of it where um, we're finding other people to do it. Now he said this model for him would have allowed him to say to his clients, see, we can do, and we have a pricing matrix for this different type of work. So tier one work will go through the main agency and tier two will go through this and tier three will go through here. And he said, because the biggest challenge they've got is 
that agencies will, you'll often see in the trade press, they've won such you know, a big client, but increasingly they're only getting a very small, a fraction of the actual work that the client's putting through because it's either going in house or it's going, um, or it's going to other you know, low cost agencies. Good. Thank you. Um, one thing uh, when you talked about the prioritization matrix, uh, Darren, um, I mean, on one side, we, we discussed now, okay, make your prioritization, uh, look at it under the COVID uh, circumstances, which may change the product set that you need to push uh, forward for, for your companies. It may change as well your strategic, uh, the weight of strategic topics versus the weight of sales topics. Um, but still as well, you should not uh, trade too much into the strategic topics because there will be the time afterwards and you probably need to find the right uh, strategy for that changed environment afterwards. Um, then agency compensation model is definitely another topic. But I think one thing too is focusing on those channels that generate the best return on investment, which is one of the dimensions that you have. Yeah. So which are the really effective channels that you should focus on? Well, and I think yeah. that's a, a thing that will perhaps change with uh, COVID. What's your opinion on that? So we've already seen uh, a shift. Obviously, uh, marketers are moving their media investment into different channels. You know, one of the things that... Uh, we have seen, especially in the US and, and other markets, is that uh, television, even though you'd think people working from home would be watching more television, they're actually uh, putting more money online because they're thinking, the thinking is the people are sitting at home looking at their computers if they're working. Um, we saw a drop in podcast time because uh, podcasts, uh, people usually listen when they're commuting and no one's commuting at the moment. So, you know, there's been some fundamental shifts. The single biggest problem is that for too many marketers and too many agencies, they're trying to be in every channel. Now, what if you, if you can't afford to be in every channel, and very few marketers can, what you should be looking for is identifying those channels specifically for your brand that give you the biggest return on investment. Now, that return on investment could be direct sales, it could be brand awareness or brand, uh, uh, brand uh, saliency, whatever the measure of success is for your, for your media activity, that's what you should be looking at. But this idea of having to be in every channel, you end up putting what we call spreading the chicken feed very thin rather than focusing on the specific channels that you can own. That's, that's a strategy for now. The strategy post-COVID is being even more diligent in looking at the channels that are going to target your audience rather than just going for mass reach. Unless you're a PNG, I mean, I think it's amazing that PNG doubled down, so doubled their media expenditure. Well, why wouldn't you? Everyone's washing their hands, everyone's washing their clothes, everyone's at home looking after themselves, buying PNG products. So this is a, a boon time for them, and if they've got the cash, they should do it. But for the vast majority of, of marketers, you're going to be doing more with less. So you should be becoming much more strategic at working with your media agencies to identify the channels that are giving you that return. And that means actually testing and learning in some cases, putting in place a test and learn to see what the performance is. Very good. We have another question, Darren. Um, perhaps we dial in Andreas. Yes. Um, Andreas is being connected. We will okay. see if the system His works. His microphone is still muted. Okay. Well, I think he wrote as well the question. So he asks, 
what would be the initial steps you would recommend to undertake? What would be, what would you recommend at this stage? To, to, to uh, implement a, uh, a, a tiered model. Yeah, I think so, yes. Yeah. Is he, uh, so, so the very first step is to, to start looking at building a framework for the marketers to use. If you're in procurement, this is a great conversation to have with marketers. If you're in marketing, this is a great way to start planning for the immediate future. You know, when your budget cut comes, you can then use the prioritization matrix to work out where you will not be investing so that you can put more into the brands and into the projects that are actually going to either drive strategy or drive financial performance. So the starting point is to start with a, in implementing a prioritization matrix. If you're managing multiple brands, you would do it by brand. If you've got a single brand, say you're a bank, you would do it by products and services, credit card versus home loan versus, you know, uh, private bank, Verita, yeah, and so on and so forth. You would start looking at where, are, where should I be investing for, to drive my strategy and to drive my return on investment. So that's the first level. The second level is then to start looking at your vendors, your supply chain in marketing, and start to align that to your strategic needs. So if you're noticing that you're, uh, you're going to be increasing, for instance, your personalization, uh, that you're going to be doing more what used to be called direct marketing, then you would want to start looking at, do we have the right agencies? And then building them into a tier. And as I said before, tier one is the ones that are going to be strategic business drivers. Tier two are your specialists and tier three are your commodity suppliers. Then the third step is to actually then look at how can we align the way we pay these suppliers to the strategic importance, to that tiered approach, which comes straight out of your matrix and turns itself into an output-based model. And in fact, you know, we've, we started off doing an output-based model for uh, creative agencies and digital agencies, but we've also just recently done them for experiential, for shopper, for uh, PR. There's you know, it's virtually a, a, a applicable to any of the disciplines that uh, you have in your media, uh, in your uh, marketing supply chain. Okay, so thank you very much um, for that. I think uh, if there are some more questions, please ask them now. Um, otherwise, we will as well uh, distribute, of course, that uh, uh, workshop and uh, that uh, uh, talks that we had today um, after the, um, I think on Monday, we will send it uh, to everybody who has registered. And um, as well for the ones that could not participate uh, today, uh, so that they can they can hear to that. Um, I think it was very interesting to see that although we have COVID now and things are turning upside down and down under becomes Europe and Europe becomes down under, um, we th there is definitely some prioritization work that now needs to be done. There needs to be an assessment: what is my uh, what is my uh, changed environment? how have all these COVID uh, restrictions that we have and uh, changes in my supply chain and changes in my uh, product demand, in my customer behavior, what kind of immediate impact they have, uh, make a matrix for that immediately, but then as well start to uh, plan uh, what are the long-term effects, which we probably don't even know yet. I think, you know, when we, when we are locked down and I heard this morning, for example, from one of my customers, they're going back to office, not before October. Um, not before October, they ex expect to be off uh, home office um, from, uh, from their management. Um, that will impact. And either we then drop back and, and go back to how it was before, because before was better, then we're fine, we're taking the old plans. Or it is really a changed environment and we need to do all our marketing plans and our media plans and all these things totally new, which is exciting time for marketeers. I mean, it's not, it's not, uh, it has not always only a bad, uh, bad side uh, of, the, uh, of the entire uh, 
crisis here. Um, no, I think uh, there is a, there's a exciting times and uh, we will see if we probably have in a couple of weeks another follow-up to see how we've progressed since then. 